So I lost my car keys this week. I lost my car keys this week. And, hey, Brendan, good to hear you, buddy. And losing my car keys means that I lost my house keys. They're all in the same key ring. I lost my car keys, I lost my house keys, which also then means I lost my church keys or my work keys. Has anybody ever lost their car keys or their house key or their work keys before? So it's bad enough that I lost my car key, but when I bought the car, it came with two car keys, so I have a spare. It's bad that I lost my house key, but I have a garage door opener in my car, so I can still get into the house, and inside the house, I have a ring and I have an extra house key. But losing my work keys is a whole nother situation. Losing my work keys means that I need to come in and I need to have a meeting with human resources. I have to go see HR. And HR has to assign me a set of replacement keys. My name goes on a list of people who have lost keys. You get what I'm saying? It's a whole situation. It affects my pride because I've got to go to someone who works on staff for me and tell them I need keys and then watch them put my name on the list of irresponsible people. <laughs> who have, Right? It's a whole thing. It's a whole situation. Maybe you've lost your keys before or you've lost a wallet. You know the hassle of getting credit cards replaced, the license replaced, the pictures of your kids in the back of the wallet that now have to be replaced. And I mean, I'm looking everywhere. Maybe, maybe when you've lost something you were looking to, maybe you lost a receipt to, to something that you wanted to return or a warranty card to something that has now broken. And you're looking everywhere. And I'm asking myself, where did I lose my car keys? So the first place we always have to look when we're looking for our car keys is, did I leave them in the bathroom? Right? Are they in the bathroom? Did I put them on the sink or whatever? Are they in the bathroom? Are they lost in my couch? Did I sit down and they fall out of my pocket and they're in my couch? Are they in my car? Because my car doesn't, I don't have to put the key in the car. I just have to have that key fob somewhere near the car and I could drive it. Did they fall out of my pocket going to the seat? I'm looking everywhere to find what I lost. Today we're beginning a brand new series called Seeker. And today's topic is this, lost and found. Lost and found. Have you ever had to go to the lost and found and look for something there? We have one here. It's in our coat room right outside the doors here. We have baskets, and if people leave stuff on the seats or drop something in the parking lot, we take it, we put it in the lost and found, and people then go and search through these baskets of stuff to find what they lost. This week, we're going to set you up for the entire series. We're going to walk you through different stories of the Bible through the next few weeks, looking at others who were seeking something. Some people were seeking healing. Some people were seeking finances. Some people were seeking hope. But all in all, these people were seeking a replacement to a problem that they had. Maybe we've done this in other areas of our lives. Maybe we were looking to replace the pain of our past by emptying a bottle. Looking for a replacement to a problem. The main text in our series is going to be this Hebrews 11.6. And it says this. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him, anyone who comes to God, must believe that he exists and that he is a rewarder of those who earnestly or diligently seek him. My question to start today is, do you believe that your life pleases God? Because this scripture says here that without faith, you cannot please God. It is impossible to please God. So you have to first look at, do I possess faith? Do I live 
a life of faith. If I don't live a life of faith, then I can't be in a posture or a position to please God. So self-reflection, do you believe that your life is one of faith that pleases God? Without faith, it is impossible to please God. And we're going to dissect this verse throughout the series, and we're going to look at it a little bit more later. But I want to throw that question out there to you. Do you have faith? Do you have faith in God? Let's look at what Jesus says when it comes to faith to find things. In Matthew 7, 7, Jesus is speaking. He says this, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Now let's point something out here today that God did not create life as a huge hide and seek game. God is not purposely hiding things throughout the universe for you to have to go find and be in a toil your whole life. That's not what this is about at all. But I want to ask you this question like this. Do you ask God for things? Do you ask Him? Or do you just assume that because we're Christians... God should do everything for us automatically. All right, let's talk about this for a second. Let me, let me help somebody's relationship today. Ready? If you're not taking notes, write this down in your heart. You cannot expect what you do not express. You cannot expect what you do not express. We are not mind readers. Your spouse, your significant other, is not a mind reader. They don't know you want flowers today because you're in a bad mood. They don't know that. Okay? They don't know that you just had a hard day at work and you want a foot rub. Ah, you never rub my feet. Was I supposed to? Or did you ask me to? Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. If you never have a conversation that you say to your spouse, my whole life, when my dad came home from work, my mom had dinner ready on the table, I would love that to be part of our family routine. Guys, she's not going to think about that. She wasn't raised in your home. She wasn't raised that way. They ate microwave dinner on snack trays in front of the TV. Come on, I'm just throwing this out there. You cannot expect what you do not express, but because we believe that God is all-knowing, he's omniscient, he's omnipotent, which he is, that he should just do everything because I thought about it. After all, We do 99% of our praying in our head. Let's pray. And I'm just going to throw something out there to you guys today. Nowhere in the entire Bible does it say pray in your head. Nowhere in the entire Bible does it say think about prayers. It says speak to your circumstances. It says speak to your mountain. It says that when the word of God comes out of your mouth, it it turns from being the logos to the sword of the spirit. The word of God is not the sword of the spirit until it's spoken out of your mouth. It doesn't become a weapon that can cut through life's problems until it is spoken. All right. Anyway. But do you know why we believe that God should answer everything because we think about it? Because of one passage in the Bible that says... If you think to do something wrong in your head, you've already done it. And we have this entire doctrine on the belief that God is sitting in heaven, eavesdropping on every thought that goes through our minds. Does he, does he need to do that? I mean, let's just think about that for a second. Does he need to do that? Come on, think about it for a second. 
We, we, we have a philosophy that's just wrong. It's, it's tainted with guilt and shame. That every bad thought that goes through our mind, God's judging us. And I would dare say that just because he could do something doesn't mean that he is doing something. Just because he could do something doesn't mean he is doing something. We, we have poetic scriptures of David. Lord, you know the thoughts and intentions of my heart. True. But does that mean that he's now judging all of those thoughts, intentions, and everything? So Jesus is speaking to a bunch of religious people who were trying to impress God by their deeds, by their clothing, by their actions. And now they walk up to, the, to Jesus, the word made flesh, and they're trying to act all arrogant in front of him. And he's like, you think that you have it all together because you got the right clothes? Because you pray at the altar every week? Because you say the right words? He's like, you're full of dead man's bones. He's like, you think you say the right things, but you're thinking the wrong things. And he used it to say, listen, even if you think about doing it, you did it. You're guilty. He wasn't making it a doctrine of faith. He was putting someone who was putting their actions and their behaviors above their true relationship with God in their place. That's what I'm saying today. The Bible says you have not because you ask not. It doesn't say you have not because you thought not. Use your mouth. Pray out loud. Make a request known to God. I need help in this situation. I need direction. He says ask and it will be given. Seek and you will find. But why do I need to ask God? Why do I need to ask Jesus? Well, now we got to go back to the beginning of humanity. we got to go back to the first week of existence. The fall of humanity happened within the first week of existence. We know this for one of two reasons. Um, they never celebrated a Sabbath in the garden in Scripture. So that was within a week. And it, they never knew one another, consummated the marriage until it was like time to be thrown out. So it was, it was pretty quick. It was like right away, okay? At the fall of humanity, when Adam ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, humanity lost something. We lost our closeness to God. We lost the authority on earth. And it's been man's journey throughout the ages to regain that close relationship that was lost. You see, man lost his keys. He lost his keys. He lost his access to God in that deep, meaningful way. And this all happened through one man, Adam. And I know that we got people in the church world who say, man, when I get to heaven, I'm going to have some words with Adam. No, you're not. No, you're not. You're going to get to heaven, and you're going to be so far out of your league. You're going to be like that kid the first day going to high school. <laughs> oh, that's, that's Moses. That's Aaron. That's Joshua. That's Jacob. Right? I mean, you're not going to walk up in there and be like, yo, Adam. Because the truth of the matter is, we would have all ate the apple too. No, we do it every day. We eat apples in our lives every day. We make promises to God and we break them. I'm going to get up today, I'm going to read my Bible. <laughs> Snooze. We eat the apple every day. Okay? Okay? Man lost his keys, he lost his accent. Watch this in Romans 5.12. Remember Romans 5.12. It says, therefore, just as sin entered the world through how many men? One man. And death through sin. And in this way, death came upon all people because all were now guilty of sin because of one man. One man's choice created a separation between God and man. And it's been man's mission ever since to find God. 
And man searches in all different places to find God or to find a higher power, they, to find the meaning of life, to find the thing that's going to fulfill them. We see guys climb the highest mountains to try to have some kind of encounter with God. We've flown into outer space and now we want to get to Mars to see if there's life on Mars. We've dug holes to the center of the earth in search of the meaning or to prove heaven or hell. And the scriptures tell us that if we are going to seek something of God, that we have to seek in a different way than the world seeks. Let's take a look at this in Matthew 6.25. Jesus is telling us this. He says, therefore I tell you, do not Worry about your life. Are you kidding me? That's all we worry about. That's all we worry about is our life. Come on, somebody. Do I have to wear a mask or do I not have to wear a mask? All we do is worry about our life. How long am I going to live? Did I take my vitamins today? Did I take my medication? Are my kids going to be safe? Can my kids go back to school? Can they not go back to school? All we do is worry about life. How can I make my home better for my kids? How can I leave an inheritance to my children? How can I have a nicer house? How can I drive a nicer car? All we are working for is life. And then Jesus says this, don't worry about your life. Don't worry about what you're going to eat or drink. That's all we're thinking about right now. Where are we going out to eat after church? (laughs) Come on. (laughs) Right? Yeah, you're thinking about it. You're hangry already. Well, this guy just stopped. I'm hungry. Ten and a half minutes in. (laughs) Thinking about they're going to open a White Castle in Middletown or not. He says, don't think about what you're going to eat or drink. Don't think about your body. Man, I already put my COVID-10 on. I need to lose some weight. He says, don't worry about your body, what you will wear. Yo, that was a struggle this morning. I wanted to wear a bracelet, so I had to match my shoes to my bracelet and my shirt. It had to be coordinating. Can't be mismatched. And Jesus is kind of like slaying this whole thing. Don't worry about if Outback is open or not. Don't worry if your sneakers match your, sh- your shirt. Is life not more than food and the body more than clothes? And then he breaks it down. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns. And yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Well, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what my value is. Because I certainly am around others who I allow to not value me. I make decisions in my life that prove I don't value myself. I know my history. I know my behaviors. I'm not sure God values me. Fact, if you destroy an eagle egg and get caught, you're going to jail. But you can destroy a human egg at the age of 14 without parental consent. So society says, no, you're not more valuable than a bird. And we accept it. I don't ask God for anything because I don't know if he values me enough to answer me. So to answer that question, am I more valuable than a bird? I don't know that. So I don't ask. Come on, this is reality here, guys. Watch what he says. Can anyone by worrying add a single hour to your life? 
And why do you worry about clothes? Because they're nice. I'm just kidding. <laughs> See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. They're not worrying how they look. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you? And then he kind of gives a little slay there, but let's just change it. So do you have faith? So do you have faith? Because remember, Hebrews 11, 6, without faith, we're not going to ask anything of God. Do you have faith? He says, you should. So don't worry saying, what shall I eat? What shall I drink? Or what shall I wear? Watch. For the pagans, the world, the ungodly run after these things. And your heavenly father knows you need these things. But this is how you ask. Ready? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. God requires that you put him first. First place. Seek first the kingdom of God. And what I've seen is that we have this habit of seeking goods instead of seeking God. I'm seeking the goods. I'm not seeking God. This does not say, seek ye first healing. Seek ye first prosperity. Seek ye first a job. It says, come to God first about a job. Come to God first about the healing. Seek first the kingdom of God and right standing with him. I've seen that we've taken Sunday and moved it from the first day of the calendar to the last day of the calendar. As if Sunday gets the leftovers from the week. Instead of Sunday being the first of my life, the first of my week, the first of my attention, it's leftovers. And I don't know about you, but I hate leftovers. I don't want to have to microwave something that was intended for yesterday and eat it today. I want something fresh. Give me something fresh. Huh? So our job here at Family Church and our job as a global church, I'm talking about all of us, our job is to present the gospel in a way or to be an example in a way that people who are seeking Find what they're looking for. If someone is seeking peace, they should experience peace when they're with you. And a lot of times we're just so emotionally charged about our own life that when someone starts venting to us, we just match their hysteria instead of bringing them calm. Come on, I'm just throwing this out there. I'm talking about being a good neighbor. When people come to this church, they should find what they're seeking. If people are seeking to know God, they should find that here. Now, we understand that not everyone's going to enjoy the flavor of church that we are. We know that not everybody wants flashy lights and haze machines and subwoofers and electric, like we know that. We know that we're, we're what's called a modern church. But there's a group of people who maybe have been hurt by traditional church that are looking for modern church. We minister the gospel in a way that we do not apologize for the gifts of the Spirit and the move of the Spirit and who the Holy Spirit is today. We don't apologize for that. We don't, we don't orchestrate our sermons to be less offensive. We know that the gospel of Jesus Christ is offensive. It's offensive. It is. It, the Bible says that Jesus is the cornerstone. He's also the stumbling block. Because there is only one way to eternal life, and that is through Jesus Christ, and that is highly offensive. 
We get that. But we want to create a worship environment that if you are seeking truth, if you're seeking an encounter with God, you will find it here. And here's what I found. That while I was looking for my car keys, I found a bunch of stuff that was lost that I wasn't currently looking for. (laughs) I found a bunch of stuff, right? I found the key to my safe. I've been looking for that thing because it's annoying to uh, two, three turns to the left, then back two turns to the right. Then it's just easy to put a key in that thing. I found a cell phone charger that I had been looking for because it charges my phone like five times faster. I had been missing it, but as I went on a search to find my keys, I found the charger. I found, you're going to love this one because you love when it happens to you. I found money in a pair of pants. Hey! Just enough money for Starbucks coffee. Thank you very much. Free money. But I found money that I didn't know I had because it was hidden in a pair of pants. I was looking for my car keys. I was looking for access to my car, to my house, to my office. But along the journey of seeking... I found access to all sorts of things I wasn't looking for. In church life today, people are going to walk through these doors who are looking for all sorts of things, and they're not actually looking for God. There's going to be people, as they seek, they're going to find security, just like my safe key. There's going to be people who are, will find power, like my charger. People will find prosperity, just like the money that was in my pocket. As we seek the kingdom of God, first, there's add-ons. There's add-ons. This is what it says. Things will be added unto it. There's add-ons. So my son, he's seven. He's discovered online gaming. Online gaming. He's, he's now on his phone, and I can hear him, and he's just talking. I'm like, who are you talking to? He's like, oh, it's my crew. From, I mean, seven. <laughs> What's the game he plays? Fortnite. With your son. Fortnite. No, oh, I'm with my crew. We're on Fortnite. We're about to storm the castle. I'm like, dude, you're seven. <laughs> what was my point with all that? Oh, he comes to me. And he's like, Dad, I need 10 bucks. I'm like, what do you need $10 for? He was like, I need to buy guns. I'm like, what are you talking about? He was like, there's in-game purchases, and I can buy different hardware for my character, and then I can have more than the other guys, and then I'll have an advantage. See, inside the game, there's add-ons. There's add-ons. And, he, and then there's, Nick gets to another board and then there's add-ons. And then there's add-ons. And as he gets to another level, there's, there's new add-ons. And, and God's saying as you seek the kingdom of God, there's add-ons. And then you're going to get to another level and then there's add-ons. And then you're going to get higher and then there's add-ons. And <laughs> things can be added on to you, but put God first. Put him in his place. As we're going to see in this series, most of the people that we look at weren't actually seeking God. They were seeking healing. They were seeking peace. They were seeking joy, safety, eternal life, prosperity. They were seeking direction for their life. How apropos right now in this season to seek God for some direction. It used to be that we sought God for direction. After high school, am I going to go to college? After college, where am I going to work? After I work, where am I going to retire? But now we're in a season right now where we could really redesign everything about our lives because we're kind of all at a reset, fresh start. I could go after any dream I want right now because the economy is garbage. We may or may not have jobs. 
What's the direction for my life? We're going to discover some of those steps throughout this series. And I want to ask you today is this. What are you seeking? Because Hebrews eleven six 6 told us this, that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So here's a fact. If you don't feel like you have been rewarded in life by God, then we have to ask ourselves, have I been diligently seeking Him? He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Well, God's never done anything for me. Have you diligently sought Him? Have you diligently worked towards a deeper relationship with Him? He guarantees to reward the seeker, the seeker. He promises that if you do the seeking, he will do the rewarding. Here's what I know about this scripture. The scripture tells us that it starts with faith. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. And this is where we as humans miss the mark is because we end up having faith for stuff instead of faith for God. When a loved one is sick, do you have faith for healing or do you have faith for the healer? Do you have faith for a blessing or faith in the blesser? Do you have faith for the promise or faith in the promiser? See, that's, that's the difference. I was raised in the faith movement where we were taught faith for stuff. And so we were real good at getting stuff. But at the end of the day, we didn't have a relationship with God. Come on. There is a reward to seeking Him. As we begin to close today, I want to look at what comes after Romans 5.12. Romans 5.12, because of one man, sin entered the world and death by sin. But watch this in Romans 5.18. Consequently, so yes, that happened, but here was the cure. Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. For just as through the disobedience of one man, many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of one man, the many were made righteous. Yes, we lost access through Adam, but we regained access through the second Adam, Jesus Christ. Jesus was the replacement set. He was the replacement set gifted to us by God the Father. We now have access to God through Jesus Christ. And I gotta tell you this, Jesus not only has the keys, but Jesus is the key. Jesus is the key, watch this. In Revelation 1.18, he says, I am the living one. I was dead, and I love this part, but now look, check me out. See what I'm doing right now. He said, just look, just look around. I am, I'm alive, I'm still in operation in the world today, just look. I'm alive forevermore and I hold the keys of death and of hell. He is the key, he is the answer. We may be searching for all sorts of things, but Jesus is the key. He is the answer behind every problem. So I'm going to ask again, what are you seeking today? Have you found the key? Here's what's scary about me losing my work keys. I have one very special key on that key ring of my work keys. It's called the master key. It's actually stamped on both sides. The first side says master, and the back side says do not duplicate. 
I can't just take that key anywhere and get a copy made. No legitimate key maker will copy that key. It's actually illegal for them to do that. But that master key has access to every single door on this entire campus. It has access to every gate lock outside, everything down at PJ Park, every door, every closet, every lock possible. That one key opens every door. Now, if I find you in one of my closets because you got my keys, there's going to be a whole situation. That master key gives all authority, all access to anybody who has a hold of that key. I'm going to tell you today, the Bible says that Jesus needs to be our master and our Lord. I'm telling you today that if you will grab a hold of Jesus, if you get a hold of Jesus, if you get a hold of Him, you get a hold of the answers to all of your life's problems, every circumstance and every situation, He is the all-access key to what God has promised and the blessings in the Christian life. I'm going to ask you today, if you're watching online or in the room, do you have the master in your life? Do you have him in your life? Because the result of having him in your life should be that he's rewarding you. If you're living a life void of godly reward, it might be time to change focus. Start thinking more heavenly thinking more godly thoughts instead of more earthly, worldly thoughts. Today, I want to offer this to you. If you're watching online or in this room, maybe you've never had an opportunity to grab a hold of Jesus. We want to give that opportunity to you today. We make it very simple here at Family Church. We pray a prayer, and we would like to pray that with you in support of those making that decision today. And that prayer goes like this. Dear God, I come to you just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I invite you into my life to change me and to make me new. Thank you for accepting me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you're watching online today and you prayed that prayer for the very first time, would you hit that button that says hand raised or comment amen in cop capital letters in any one of our chat rooms? We would love to follow up with you and send you a book called Starting Point. It's a seven-day devotional for your first seven days as being a Christian and getting your life with Christ started. If you're in here today and, and you prayed that prayer for the very first time, would you allow us the honor to celebrate you for two quick seconds. Could you just wave at me today if you prayed that for the first time? Anybody here? Ah, I see you back there. Anybody else real quick? Awesome. If you stop at the Welcome Center, we would love to give you a starting point book. Or uh, we also have another book called Welcome Home. It talks about Christianity, what we believe here. Maybe you walked in here today and you're saying, I don't know about a guy who would wear matching shoes to a bracelet. This church thing might be too weird for me. Get the Welcome Home book and just see what our statements of faith are. See what we believe. See what this Christianity walk, how it might impact and, and be connected to the life that you're currently living. As we leave today, I want to pray a blessing, but... Um, because of social distancing and the way that we have to do things, uh, we don't pass the offering plate down the aisles right now, but we do have baskets um, at the doors on the way out. Father, we thank you today that the word of God will never return void, but it will accomplish exactly what it was set forth to do. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for inspiring us once again to seek first the kingdom of God. Let us live a life of one who is constantly seeking seeking what you have next for us in our lives. 
Lord, I thank you that as we are able to give financially into the kingdom, that you open the windows of heaven, you pour out a blessing that there's not room enough to receive. We thank you, Lord, that nowhere in the New Testament did it ever say that you shut the windows of heaven from blessing the believer. So, Lord, as we leave here today, everything we set our hands to will prosper and be successful. We are blessed coming in. We'll be blessed going out in Jesus' name. Amen. Love you. Have a great weekend. Thank you.